Wales's House Ways and Means Committee were meeting on June 2nd, Tuesday, um, after a cold, long cold weekend and another cold day. Um, so we have um, uh, the yield bill that was a committee bill that came out of our committee uh, passed second reading on Friday. It's up for third reading today. And we have um, three, uh, I think there's more than three amendments, but three, three proposers of amendments um, who are gonna be with the committee this morning. Um, we've set aside roughly 10, 15 minutes for each of them. Um, and once we're done with that, uh, we're gonna hear from uh, Chip Conquest, who is uh, gonna, I'm not sure exactly what time he's coming in, but he, the Appropriations Committee is continuing to work on, the, on what I call the phase one budget. Um, and um, he's gonna talk to us about the education um, appropriation in that in the budget. Um, and then um, the time we have left, we're gonna work on the school construction bill. Um, and I noticed today when I was looking at that bill that it, it's described as a bill to cease the moratorium on school construction aid, which is what the underlying bill said. And of course the bill, that's not what the bill does. And I mentioned that partly because people keep saying, oh, are you gonna, stop the moratorium and I keep thinking I don't know why people are asking me that but then I look at the title and I realize that's why so just to, that's the bill unfortunately they used a bill that had a title that um, is no longer has anything to do with the content in the bill um, so that's what our morning will look like and um, just to also remind people that we have a, a caucus of the whole um, of the whole house today at 3 30 and um, I assume uh, uh, the yield bill will be part of one of the issues that will be discussed and um, possibly also the hunting and fishing licenses for um, members of Abenaki tribes with I'm guessing because we didn't do that in a house caucus uh, last week. I don't think. Um, anything else that uh, anybody wants to bring up before we get started? Oh, okay. Uh, Cynthia, I think we have you first on the agenda. So why don't you go ahead and uh, we've got the am amendment. I think people got it this morning. Um, and why don't you go ahead and tell us what it, what it does. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Cynthia Browning from Arlington. Uh, this amendment simply adds a section to the existing H-955. And in this section, I'm trying to, I'm trying to suggest that the General Assembly make an, a renewed commitment to education finance reform, deform, yeah, that's right, that's good. Education finance reform along several different lines. I know that we have worked on some of these issues over the years. I know the tax director commission is studying this right now and we can await their recommendations. But I think the fact that we have not fully addressed these issues and made substantive changes has made the current crisis worse. Uh, property taxes are higher than they might otherwise be. Students who are particularly needing may not be getting the assistance they need despite higher costs overall. Um, our, the money that is used to support home ownership may largely be going to people who have homes and are in no danger of homelessness. And yet it won't help the people who are suffering through loss of income this year since it's based on last year. And then there's the fact that we are paying for various items in the education fund that are not in fact education. So this amendment is an attempt to renew our commitment to looking at those matters and uh, not proposing any particular changes now, um, but asking the Senate and House committees to work on these issues and to, to, to bring reports to the full bodies, whether it's through bills that are introduced or through issue briefs each year by March 1st for the next four years. Um, it may be that some people don't think this is necessary because of course we have struggled with these issues already and everybody knows about them. 
but I think it is necessary because I don't see the kind of movement um, that we should be making on these issues from before this crisis hit. And I don't want this crisis to serve as an excuse to push these reform issues to the side and neglect to, the direct, to address them in the near future. So um, I look forward to the committee's response. I would be open to any changes in the language that would make the amendment uh, useful to the committee. I certainly um, drafted it relatively quickly with the help of Ledge Council. So um, if there are ways that it could be improved and found acceptable, I'm totally open to both. All right, let me see if there are questions. Um, anyone on the committee have a question? Don't see anybody. Um, Scott, and Sam. I sorry, I was late. At Zoom got the best of me this morning. Um, so I'm just I'm looking at this um, this list in this section, Cynthia, and there's not a single item there that I don't agree that needs to be addressed. And in fact, I've submitted several bills addressing several of them over the the years. Um, my question though is that isn't all this being looked at by the Tax Structure Commission? I believe they are looking at it and they will um, produce a report for us. I, I ran out of time to look at their website and the language as to when that report is due. And I greatly look forward to that report. However, we know that there's a tendency for the General Assembly to receive reports and say, thank you so much. And then you don't necessarily have reform based on that report, however useful it may have been. So this, this recommitment that I'm asking for certainly does not exclude waiting for their report and acting on their report. You'll know that I'm presenting this as a four-year process because I think that's what it may take to look at these different elements and how they might fit together in new ways. And the report of the Tax Structure Commission will be an essential component of that study. But it's the two committees in the General Assembly that have the final responsibility for this and uh, not to move forward and continue to struggle with these issues, to my mind, would be a great failure. Uh, Sam, I think you had your hand up. Did you take it down? I did. And my question was essentially the same as Scott's. Okay. I feel like I had my answer. Yeah. Uh, George. I'm just a little bit curious about the um, the timeline of what could get done before March 1st, 2021. Um, you know, short of a summer study committee or something like that. I, it's a little hard for me to envision that by 2020, March 2021, with a brand new committee starting in January, there's really going to be time to to do that. Can you tell me your thinking around the this March 2021 date? Well, my recollection is that um, we generated uh, some reform proposals uh, along along these lines, um, along some of the lines. Uh, I can't remember which year it was, if it was the first year I was on the committee or the second year of on, um, I was on the committee. If you wish to change the dates, that's fine, but you'll note I'm not asking for any particular product on that date if, if, if the new committees which to look at the list, look at the materials they have and produce an issue brief that said, these are the things we're looking at and we'll go forward with it, that would be sufficient. But one of the problems I have with the way that we tend to work is this is such a difficult and sensible area that the full body tend to leave it to the tax committees and that's understandable. But then when the proposals get out, the, it's hard for them to evaluate it. And so I think they need to be brought into the process because if we're really, these reform proposals will be difficult because there will be always be ups and downs and confusion. And I think they need to be brought into the process. And I think it's gonna take several years, but we have to have some structure that requires us to have sustained commitment. If you don't like that timeline, you can say starting in 2022, you can make, I was gonna make it April 1st, but that's April Fool's Day, so I didn't wanna do that. So. Um, you can make it a different year, you can make it a different month. Um, 
I just feel there needs to be some structure in place so that the difficulty of this path does not discourage us and allow us to keep putting it off because I think that would be a disservice to Vermonters. Uh, anyone else have a question? Um, I don't know if any, does anybody, Sorsha, maybe you know when the tax structure uh, commission is supposed to do its report. Do you have um, Yeah, I, I don't have the exact date off the top of my head, but I believe it's February 15th. Uh, February 15th of 21. Uh, 2021, yeah. Of 21, great. Yep. Um, so by then, we would have a much clearer idea of what they're doing. Uh, uh, Scott. Thanks, Sarsha. I knew somebody would know. Um, Scott. Um, I don't know how he would do this. Um, maybe Sarsha could work some of her magic, but would it make sense to try to get somebody from the Tax Structure Commission on for, you know, five or 10 minutes to give us a quick update about what they're doing as far as education finance examination? Well, um, it might. Um, I, um, I don't know how feasible that is um, just, I'm just trying to think. Um, well, let, let's think about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, the, other, uh, the other question I had was, um, and I've got, and Peter's on, uh, Conlon's on here somewhere, hi, um, was that the education committee also has a role in, um, in really all of these issues, although principally the weighting uh, formula, um, but is also involved in education finance. So um, I, don't, I don't know how that works in the Senate. In some ways this feels like, um, you know, it's, it's a description of the jurisdiction of the committee um, in a lot of ways with some flesh on the bones. Um, Peter, do you have any thoughts at all? Your comment. Uh, uh, so I, I I agree with you. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we're invited to be part of the conversation. I mean, a lot of this does have to do with tax policy, um, but uh, I'm you know I'm just here to ask questions if I have them. But at the moment, I don't have much to offer. Okay, thank you, um, Mark. Well, so if we decide we want to hear from the tax commission, we'll we'll figure that out over the course of the morning. Um, we've got some time, but are there any other questions for Cynthia? Um, any last thoughts, Cynthia? Oh, Scott, you go ahead. Yeah, Madam Chair, I would be again. I want to emphasize that I would be open to any changes, the inclusion of the education committees. Um, moving the date uh, to reflect the tax structure commission report, you, know, you can move the date to May 1st, and then next year would be setting up the work for the for the succeeding year. There's all different kinds of things you can do. I understand that these are things that we work on all the time, so people may think, well, we don't need to make this commitment. But I think there's something useful in having the full body agree that we need to work on uh, on these issues and, and to have that be a joint commitment so it can't just keep sliding off because it's because it's too hard. So uh, if there are ways to make this amendment um, useful to the committee that you would wish to amend it, I'm totally open to that. Um, and I would await uh, the committee's judgment about it. And Madam Chair, may I ask, may I stay on the Zoom meeting so I can hear the other amendments? If you prefer, I can get off and go to the YouTube I won't speak or anything. I just wanted to ask your permission to do that. Sure. No, that's fine. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Scott and then Jim, and then we're going to move on to the other amendment. Okay. Just a quick question. I mean, as far as these different things that you're interested in, Cynthia, I mean, I could put together a comprehensive bill to cover all of them in a matter of hours. Um, but what happens, and you know, you've got a shall in there. So what happens if the Committee on Ways and Means and Senate Finance, the, the political will isn't there to move any of these forward. And that's what it's gonna take is political will. You've got a shall in there. What happens if they don't move forward a proposal? Well, remember, um, I'm asking for either the, 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 their, they report in the form of either bills or issue briefs. So if they had proposals and they were unable to pass them out of the committee, that would be that their report. And okay, the I, see, larger, I see your point. 
Okay. And then the larger body would know, wait a minute, these are things we thought we needed to do. Why can't we do them? And, and is it because the proposals are flawed or is it because we haven't developed evidence-based understanding to overcome the political resistance? Um, and, and, I, and I think that's, that's part of, of what I think the issue is because it is politically hard. And so sharing with other members and educating them and getting their input and, and their support or their objection, I think is gonna be essential to getting this, um, getting this kind of reform done. So I'm proposing a slightly different way of doing it rather than the committees working in their committee rooms and then bringing something out um, I'm proposing regular reports, bringing in the rest of the body so that they're not surprised and resistant to proposals that may come forth. Um, so we're, we're running over our time, but Jim Maslin has a question. And I'm let him answer and then I'm going to move on. Well, let not, him so ask much, it. <laughs> not so much a question as just a comment. I mean, I, I'd start where Scott started. All the pieces that Cynthia laid out are things that I support, maybe all of us support. I don't see any harm in this amendment, but then I don't see a great benefit in, in it either at this time. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, so I think that Ralph is next. Is that right on my, I'm having trouble with the documents and the agenda. Is that right, Sorsha? Is that what I've got? Yes, he's next. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, you can identify yourself for the record. You have th three, no, you have two amendments. Is that right? Or just one? That's correct. Two amendments. Two amendments. <clears throat> two amendments. Okay, good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Zachariah, Ralph, Hartland, Windsor, and West Windsor. Uh, thank you to your committee very much for taking the time to take up and review these amendments. Also, just want to give a big thank you to your legal counsel and JFO who worked <laughs> very hard to, to come up with these amendments on short notice. Um, and uh, in my in my research on this, I was uh, I was surprised. Well, not surprised, but this is an extremely complicated subject, and I appreciate your committee's work on it and 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 uh, working through all these things. So I have uh, two amendments, and I will just tell you briefly that um, you know I support the the general bill. I think that uh, we do need to um, increase the yield, uh, and I don't support the idea that. Um, that we shouldn't be taxing folks. I think uh, the underlying idea behind this amendment is that there are folks who uh, still have money and um, that are able to contribute towards making taxes less of a burden for regular Vermonters. Uh, so the first uh, amendment that I have is, uh, is um, crosses out original, strikes out section five and replaces it with two other sections. Um, and uh, this is uh, the language is uh, pretty short, but it, it is um, it's the surcharge rate for homestead properties with fair market value exceeding $1 million. Um, and it adds a surcharge of 50 cents per $100 in value. Um, so this would generate uh, approximately $4,860,000 in additional revenues. Um, my thought on this again is that if we are taxing um, folks that have higher value properties, that this will lessen the burden of the increase of the yield on regular Vermonters who have lower value properties. Um, I uh, initially, the, obviously our, uh, the returns and the revenue could be higher if we were also able to put this tax on um, non-homestead properties. However, I've learned in the process that non-homestead properties uh, is not just residential, as you all are uh, very aware, it also includes commercial businesses. Um, and at this time, I'm not interested in putting an additional tax on our commercial industries, as that is what I'm dealing with in my committee and recognize that they do not have um, the additional funds right now. So this, uh, this, the, uh, so this amendment, uh, the primary piece is at the top, the rest uh, is language corrections to adjust the bill um, for the rest of the bill for that. Um, this, uh, the effective date is meant to be retroactive so that it can be applied to the current yield. Um, and the funds would go towards the education fund. So um, that's the first amendment. Madam Chair, would you like me to uh, stop there and, and answer questions or just go right into the second amendment? Uh, let's talk because they're quite 
are they quite different or are they related? I'm, I haven't had them. Yes, the second the Second Amendment is a study, Madam Chair. It's, um, it's and it's uh, essentially oh, is meant to sort of. Yeah, it would be an alternative for this. So do them both, right? It's related okay. to this. Yeah, do them both. It is. Remember that's what it was. That, that's yeah. correct. It's because um, in my under, <laughs> of course, while digging into this and learning more about it from um, all the people involved with this is uh, th that um, it, it is clear that if we wanted to add an additional tax surcharge tax or tax uh, higher value properties and non homestead at a higher rate that uh, we need to um, essentially create a third tax category. Um, so the second amendment that I have is again section five. So if both, if you if you thought in your instant infinite wisdom that this should both amendments should be approved, then we would need to re, um, relabel the the sections. However, so this is um, this is a study that would look at the feasibility of creating a third classification of property of properties for the purposes of statewide education property tax. The third category would comp comprise non-homestead, non-commercial, and non-agricultural properties with a fair market value exceeding $1 million. So again, this would, um, this, it sorts out our, our agricultural industry, it sorts out commercial industry from the non-homestead properties. And it also, it, it's uh, essentially allows for us to tax higher value properties at a higher rate if we wanted to without um, a large amount of administrative legwork, which um, we wouldn't be able to do currently. And uh, it is my understanding that uh, that uh, the tax department or IT is currently sending, or is looking at an RFP to revise how this, uh, the tax system is structured and this could potentially serve as some advice of how they could, um, what they can include in their RFP of how that system could be structured. So those are my two amendments. Uh, you could certainly think of them as one or the other or if you like both of them, I'm certainly happy to approve both. The, uh, the first amendment is, is a proactive way of, of um, hopefully filling some of the, rev, uh, the sh revenue shortfalls in our education fund. Um, and so I think that it does serve a valuable purpose while also lessening the burden on regular Vermonters. Great, uh, Robin has a question. We'll get started there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, my question, uh, Zach, is is the 50 cent per hundred on the full value of the property that's over a million or does it start with the value that's a million and over? Where does that start? It's a great question, Representative. Um, and this is for the full value of the property. Um, this, we had a, a, I looked at both of them. If we did the taxing the excess of a million, um, the revenues generated would be significantly smaller. Um, I believe it was if we did 10 cents, it would generate about $290,000. That didn't feel like it was going to make much of an impact on the on the budget. So, this isn't the full value of the of the million dollar property. So there is a cliff. Okay. And did you did you also look at um, right now our our taxes allow homestead is considered your property plus two acres and the value of the house is um, somebody will correct me up to 400,000 or 300,000 or something. Or, uh, and so did you look at that also is anything over that amount or did you just you just only looked at the starting at zero the first dollar gets taxed this way um i so i looked at excess of a million uh that was the only thing that i looked at okay um, but, so not excess of the, okay. but um i so i'm not entirely sure how this actually applies to the income sensitive folks uh, i know that there is a in, income sensitivity around four hundred thousand properties. Uh, I'm not sure how this applies to them, actually, if um, since it is a surcharge. Uh, but again, uh, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that would, uh, that would apply to income set. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? I also, oh, sorry, if, it, if it's okay, Madam Chair, I also wanted to point out that, um, that uh, you know, I chose 50 cents as, um, as just a, a number. Uh, but uh, it can be any amount of value. This would this would increase the burden on uh, wealthy homeowners by some, uh, about seven thousand dollars annually. Um, so if um, you could also increase it to a dollar, you could also decrease it uh, depending on how much you wanted to sh fill the the, um, the hole in the in in the in the budget. Excuse me. Um, let me see if there's other questions. I've got one. Did you do any looking at all at the distribution of these million dollar plus properties, sort of where they are in the state? 
Uh, I did not. Um, uh, all I know is that there were uh, 683 parcels. If we ex if we were able to expand it to non homestead, it would be a significantly larger group of homes. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, so you, no, I don't know geographically. Where I, I didn't hear you. I, there was a sentence that cut out, and it had to do with something I was interested in. So say it again. <laughs> the last sentence you said. If we were able to expand it to. Um, what I was it? Lost you again. Oh, um, so I did not look at the geographic distribution of the homes. I said if uh, if we were able, and currently this is only 683 households, uh, properties, if we were able to expand this to non-homestead properties, it oh, would non be a significant. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear it. Um, so, yeah. And you don't know whether it applies to um, properties that are owned by somebody who's income sensitized. Mark, you know, I, I'm not entirely because this is a surcharge. I know that. Yeah, I, I know that I uh, talked about. Um, I, I think that if it, if it was just a straight tax increase, that that would probably not impact them. But because it's a surcharge, I'm not entirely sure. That would be a question for legal counsel. Well, it's a question for Mark, who just raised his hand. <laughs> yeah, um, so. I'm not. Abby can weigh in on how she drafted it, but the way I did the revenue estimate was to assume that this was a surcharge that would apply to any property worth more than a million dollars it would apply to the first dollar and there wouldn't be any adjustment for property tax adjustment but if so if you're income sensitized and you own a million dollar property you would pay the full amount even if you're income whatever you would still receive your property tax adjustment on your normal tax yeah. but the surcharge would be applied to the entire value of your property at 50 right. cents yeah right uh and Abby, that's the way it got drafted. Yeah, gathering. Okay. Uh, other questions anyone has? Um, do people have questions? Oh, Jim. Thank you. Um, I spoke with Zach yesterday. Was it yesterday? The day before, Sunday, about his first amendment. And I was. Which one is that? The, whenever uh, it was. Sunday. No, Sunday. what amendment are you talking about? The, the first one, the 50 cent. The 50 cent one. Okay, the surcharge. <laughs> and, and, um, and I know clearly where he wants to go, um, but I was troubled by the fact that at the time, or right now, we, can, we could assess this on Vermonters in their own homes, but not on, um, you know, second homes, which in some cases are valuable property owned by other people. And it seemed that the equity issue there um, was the first thing that jumped out at me. Um, and I know Zach would try to amend, uh, figure that out with the, the second uh, amendment, the second proposal, um, which I think would be worthwhile if we could figure that out. But anyway, that's my 10 cents for the moment. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Madam Chair, if I could, I just wanted to um, say that, that what Jim's referring to, I, I Unfortunately, the surcharge doesn't address my true intent. Um, the intent would have been to be more equitable and, and apply this, uh, an actual increased tax rate on uh, homestead properties uh, that are residences. Um, but we currently, it would be too difficult to actually do that. And that's why the study hopefully would create that third tax category that would make that possible for the future. And I think it opens the doors for us to, to be more in, um, intentional and precise with our, with our work. I think one of the, um, this is a comment more than a question. Um, there's, we've been talking for years in the legislature about depending more on income and less on property value. And it seems to me that this moves us in the other direction um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty forcefully when you consider that the surcharge is gonna be paid um, on the full value of a property, no matter what a person's income is. And um, so I would wanna uh, understand a whole whole lot more about what those consequences are before I went with this. On the, the other uh, proposal, the, the uh, classification study, um, we've had conversations in the committee off and on about wanting to look at different classifications. And um, I'm, I need to go back and look at the language that you've got here. But um, I, I like the idea of, of 
finding ways to um, identify different classes of properties so that we can better understand. You know, we've talked about rental properties, for example, I think, and some others, but um, I'm not sure whether, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether this is the, I don't know that it would necessarily be a third classification just described the way you're describing it. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's just a thought. So anyone else? So, it's, a, it's a great thought. Oh, sorry, it's a great thought, Madam Chair. And, and um, I'm, a, I'm a novice at this. I, I wish I was as pro as you all are at understanding this, uh, this, <laughs> this language in the edu education tax and the tax system, but certainly um, would be happy to um, you know, amend the amendment so that it it actually is the language that you would prefer to move forward. Um, I, I that so I, I'm I, like I said I I don't know enough about this to say precisely this is the way to go. This is the way my I imagined it with my little understanding of how the tax structure works. Well, it's it's certainly an interesting concept. Whether we'd have time to sort of figure out what the different pieces are in in the moment right now when we've got a bill pending on the floor. Uh, tomorrow, I'm a little dubious about that because it's complicated, but, um, and it would require some work with the tax department about what they're capable of doing and so on. But it's, a, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I'm just not sure that this is the way I would frame it, but uh, are there other, um, other people want to jump in? Emily. Um, I think too, if we were going to look at re sort of categorizing i think um residential non-homesteads are sort of the which you know we call second homes basically are sort of the missing category that we can't quite get our ha hands around a lot of the time and i'm i guess i'm curious um if the tax structure commission is looking at those categories of separating what it would look like to separate out you know rental housing from commercial properties from non-residential i don't know if this okay. is the exact moment to ask that question but i'm doing it anyway yeah, well, it's a good question. I, I think that the Tax Structure Commission is more focused on moving uh, the way we finance education more heavily onto income. I think that's where they, their focus has been rather than redoing the property tax system. But um, whatever we do with the amendments we have this morning, I think it's a great idea to have, that, have them in to the committee and have a discussion with them. And so um, I don't want to, I shouldn't characterize what they're doing without um, having them in here. So I, I will, if Sorsha will remind me, I'll put that on a, on a future agenda for us, no matter what. Um, other questions on this? I don't think so. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I have to go back to commerce, but uh, thank you for taking the time to consider our, uh, my amendments and, and thank you all for your work. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to listen to the other amendments being proposed. This is Representative Barbara Murphy uh, for the record. I um, have proposed an amendment that unlike the ones that you've already been listening to actually subtract, I think a total of five words from the original language. My intent is to remove any reference to um, future intent with um, permissive language to a deficit in the ed fund and just speak to the budget year um, we're looking at. And that's pretty much what I'm asking here. Uh, let me see if I've got questions here. Um, I have a question, but it's, I think it's really more for Abby than it is for you. Um, so if we said not, nothing about a deficit, is there any legal impediment to having a deficit in the education fund? Would you like me to answer that? Yeah. Um, great. So we did um, at Legislative Council look to try and find some sort of prohibition against running a deficit. Um, and there is, unlike in other states, there is no constitutional prohibition against running a deficit. There's no requirement either um, to have a balanced budget. Um, there also is not a statutory requirement to have a balanced budget or not to run a deficit for the education fund. I think we've looked at um, the stabilization re reserve in particular in this committee. Um, so the language um, as it was proposed by the committee 
was still fairly open about the possibility, not necessarily the intention to run a deficit, but again, it being um, an option to allow for a deficit um, in the current upcoming fiscal year and going forward. Um, so, so this wouldn't preclude running a deficit either, this yeah. amendment. My, so my question's a little, a little bit different. If we took out, I, I, I didn't like that notwithstanding language to begin with because it suggests that there is a rule and I don't believe that there is one. If we took out notwithstanding, uh, okay, lost the language. I think somebody can pop it back up there. Um, in the, in the, mm -hmm. So if we took out notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary in whatever fiscal year we're talking about, the education fund may incur a deficit. Just took that out entirely. Um, what's, what's the legal status if we have a deficit? What's the legal issue it, or is there one? I'm not sure that there is one to be. Then why do, why do we have the notwithstanding language in there? So I think it was more just to cover all bases because of there not being a strict prohibition or requirement, just to be absolutely clear that it was the intent to allow it. Um, but again, if there is no prohibition or requirement, that language could be removed. And it wouldn't have any impact? I don't believe it would. Um, and then you still have your intention if a deficit is projected or created, depending you'd still, on- You'd still start with the, if a deficit is projected. Correct. Right, yeah. Uh, that would be my preference, but anyway, um, it, it not, not to allow it, not, not, to, not to confuse things with notwithstanding laws to the contrary that don't exist um, would be, I think would be better. Scott. I think I would I would agree with that. Uh, just removing section A and then re, re uh, lettering uh, B as A. But Bar Barb, um, you said that there were five words in here you were proposing changing. The only one that I saw was the removal of the word beginning in section A. Is there another change in here that I'm missing? Yes, I removed uh, four words from section B because oh, okay. uh, the, and then the original language. Yeah. Excuse me. That, the original language of um, H959 yeah. put again that um, in just alluded to future year permissive that I, I felt was more statement than I'm comfortable making when we're responding to the COVID-19 and to the current situation. So that oh, I'm very comfortable with removing section A. I think that would be lovely. Just get rid of it totally. I see a lot of notwithstanding that I think does just get in the way of yeah. clarity. Um, but I would also say that then I would prefer and still put forward um, at least to you as a committee, um, section B become the section A, that, that it have the, the four words removed that spoke to future years. Yeah. I, okay, I see the difference there, yeah. thank you. Yeah, uh, committee, anyone else have any? Questions or any um, any thoughts about this? No? I this. Yeah, George and Peter and Scott. Everybody's now got a question. Good, George. Oh, George, you're muted. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, I think it would be fine to remove section uh, two, subsection A um, in, in its entirety, that notwithstanding language. Um, and if it, in section B, um, I don't care one way or the other about any or any succeeding fiscal year because we can do that now. Um, so it just just basically to me says, if we took those four words out, um, those five words, that um, we would need to come up with potentially a new list of options for future years, because yeah. this would only be requiring, be 
addressing the list for 2021, but I don't have any problem with that. Uh, Peter and then Scott. I, I'm a bit reluctant to uh, remove the reference to future years since we just don't know what fraction of FY21 will still be underperforming, so to say. And I think in fair notice uh, to the General Assembly and to the general public, um, the kind of tax increase that we uh, were faced with if we funded entirely through an adjustment of the property tax, I think is worth, uh, is sobering enough uh, to, to say it may well be that it'll take more than a year or two into the future uh, to rectify the damage done in FY21. Thank you. Uh, Scott. I think I'm in agreement with George. Um, I think we should remove a re-letter B, A. And I, I think we want to get rid of or any succeeding fiscal year um, because there really shouldn't be a deficit in FY22. And the reason for that is, is that, you know, the consumption when in the tax letter, we're going to have a really good idea what the consumption taxes are going to be. The districts are going to have to react to that. And that reaction will set the, the homestead and the non-homestead homestead yields and non-homestead rates to balance the fund. So there really should not be a deficit in FY22 um, unless we have some crazy circumstance in the late spring like we did this year. So I think, I think I'm in agreement with George. Yeah. Um, the other thing to point out is that Sub B is a statement of intent, it's not operational. And so when we get to a fiscal 22 deficit, um, if, that, if that should happen, and I agree, I, I will, we will have gone in with our eyes so much more wide open, voters will, the uh, school boards will, et cetera. Um, but I think, I, think we, I think we should anticipate that we don't have a deficit, create a deficit in 22. But if we did, we'd be looking at a whole, uh, probably a different list anyway. Um, so um, I'm, I'm fine uh, keeping it at, at just 21 and removing sub A. It sounds like that's where George and Scott were headed. Um, anyone, any other thoughts anyone has? Uh, so Barbara, that's that's not exactly what you had in your amendment. Um, if, um, if you wanna offer it redone or you want us to offer a substitute or whatever, however, you know, I appreciate your flagging the issue. I'm um, happy to proceed however you and the committee wanna proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would suggest, um, I think maybe for ease with Ledge Council and for ease of process, I am very supportive of what I believe you're proposing would be the committee alteration to what I'm presenting. I, I again see with everyone here saying, um, and spoke with Representative Beck over the weekend. He, Scott and I corresponded a little bit, and I think he just didn't quite see that recurring statement in this in the um, listing language that was re reinforcing for me that we were speaking beyond what I felt really was appropriate. Um, but if you're willing to go with my language in section B and just make it section A, mm -hmm. uh, I'm totally supportive of it being a committee um, substitute amendment. And I would certainly, um, as it hit the floor, just withdraw my amendment. Uh, so I guess the question is for the committee and particularly Scott and George who are reporting this, it wouldn't be a sub A, it'd just be the section because there'd be no other subsections left. But Scott, do you have a preference on how to proceed? Um, I think we um, could just ask Abby to prepare a, a committee amendment okay. um, to reflect the conversation we just had. I think that would be okay. fine. Okay, that sounds fine to me. Um, uh, uh, Peter, I know you had a different perspective. I wanna check in on the committee to see whether um, members of the committee are going to be uh, a majority anyway on board with doing that. Um, I don't know how to do that. I could do it by asking Sam. <laughs> um, I, the, 
the, doing the amendment as you suggested uh, with George and Scott, or it, that is fine with me. It makes sense to me. We're going to have to make a decision next year anyway, no and so we don't need we don't need to have authorization for several years. We can authorize what we need to do a year at a time. Yeah. So let me um, let me ask if anyone on the committee uh, will vote on it when we see the language, but. Um, I just want to make sure that this path is agreeable with people. Is there anyone on the committee who is uncomfortable with doing this or doesn't want to do it? No? Okay, so we'll have Abby redo language. Um, if we get it this morning, we'll try to vote it before noon. Is that okay? Um, and uh, the other two issues, I'm going to I'm going to postpone for the moment uh, doing a vote on them. Um, but um, if people have thoughts they want to share, um, uh, let's take a couple more minutes. And if people uh, want to, we didn't have much discussion about. Um, May I just say farewell and thank you? <laughs> this, is, this is Representative Murphy. I'd love to just thank Abby for the assistance she gave. I, I know we're putting Ledge Council through the ringer on weekends. and. I just really appreciate her help and everyone on the committee's work on on this issue. It's it's a it's a challenge to all of us, and I just really appreciate the effort everyone's putting into it. So thank you. Good. It's nice to see you. Thanks. Um, uh, committee. Any committee discussion on um, on Zach Ralph's um, two proposals? We didn't. I didn't really get much of a sense about where committee members were on those. Robin. Um, thank you. I um, I don't think I'm in favor of a surcharge rate um, that starts with the first dollar, but I do like the notion of some sort of um, property classification study. I don't know, as was mentioned earlier, whether we have time to do organize something like that the way we want right now, but at some point, I think that would be a very useful thing to have. Yeah, I I agree. I don't I don't feel that I've got um, time and focus to figure it out this morning. Um, but I, it is a subject that we've occasionally talked about. Uh, I'm sorry, George, Emily, Peter, Sam, and Jim. <laughs> I should talk. Go ahead. I think at one point somewhere along the line from Mark, we got some information about what the income levels were for those 683 properties. Somewhere in my distant past memory, it seems like we got that. And it was, it was a little bit surprising that a number of them were not high income people. Um, and you know that, that makes me a little nervous with this exactly. Um, it, but on the other hand, I also agree with, um, with the idea of trying to come up with an, an additional non-residential non-homestead residential classification, the second home classification as different from um, from what we have now. Emily. Um, I think it's important to remember that just because someone's not high income doesn't mean they're not high wealth. And so um, that could be, you know, be part of the factor in that conversation. I looked at that chart very recently as part of my crash course. And so I could, might even be able to find it more quickly than um, JFO might be able to, because it's sitting somewhere in this pile of papers in my desk. Um, so I'll pull it up in a little bit um, and send it to George. I, um, especially coming from Wyndham County, which is, seems to um, now have the highest rate of second homes in the state. And um, with all of the changes that I think are about to happen in at least my county's real estate market with folks um, buying homes, you know, sight unseen, um, I am very, very curious about really understanding um, what high value um, both residential and non-residential homes um, look like in this state and really getting a much better picture of that. And I think the only way we can do that is by really um, setting up that different classification system and really separating it out from rental and commercial markets because they have such completely different policy implications when taxed. 
So I've um, written, a, so I'm gonna hear from everybody. I also want you to know that I've written a note to myself that we're gonna hear from the Tax Structure Commission and we're also going to do some committee work on classification. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that's gonna look like or where it will end up, but I, I can uh, tell that there's certainly some interest in doing that. Peter, Sam, Jim, and Scott. Uh, thank you very much. I, I've, uh, for a long time, thought um, both for uh, political reasons, but also equitable reasons, it makes a difference whether or not we're talking uh, in regards to a residence, which is not a homestead, that we're talking about uh, the owner who may also be filing income taxes here. That is to say, they're, they're essentially contributing to the Ed Fund in two ways, as opposed to someone who does not file income taxes in Vermont, but yet owns a residence in Vermont. I, I think there's an equitable distinction to be made, quite apart from the practical issue. And I've, I've always thought it's odd that we don't somehow give credit for, for income taxes paid against some ownership of another piece of property elsewhere in the state of Vermont. Thank you. Um, I think that I, I'm not for creating, well, certainly as this proposal does, I don't think that we want to create an incentive for people to become non-residents. And I think if we want to get at the w income of people, we should do it through the income tax and that we probably already have the most complicated um, education finance system in the country. And I don't think we need an an additional level of complication without knowing how it interacts with income. Since if I am interested in a further investigation of uh, residential property types, but um, I would not be in favor of going forward with this proposal. Okay. Uh, Jim, Scott, George. I, well, in summary, I agree with Sam that I wouldn't want to create a, an incentive for people to become non-resident, you know, non-homeowners, da da da. Um, but the notion of the study is something that I think is intriguing, even though it may not be worded exactly the way we would do it if we did it ourselves. So on on balance, I'll support Zach's study. Although if we had time, I think we'd rewrite it a little bit. Yeah, I want to be clear that I, I'm not going to support it as it is, um, okay. because I think That's it's right. a distraction from what I actually would really like to be able to put some time into. But um, but the committee may be split on that. That's yeah, fine. No, I, I won't be um, upset if it doesn't pass. That's fine. Um, Scott, George, Hat. Um, I, I have taken actually uh, time to look at the um, these types of properties uh, where you have high income, low property value or high property value, low income. And there are a lot more outliers than, than people think there are. And then when you um, layer over classification and income sensitivity and all the other things in the education fund, this is a really uh, complicated decision um, that I wouldn't support making on a, in a one in one day especially when you're looking at the amounts of money that it would raise. But I am supportive of the conversation and I am looking forward to what the tax commission might say on this subject and other subjects when they report to us. Pat? No, I'm sorry, George, and then Pat. Um, I forgot to say the most important thing when I spoke a minute ago, and that is that I would not support doing an amendment, this amendment to 959. I think 959 should stay as pure as it can, just telling the towns how they can set their tax rates and get their property tax bills out. And I don't want to complicate it with other stuff. So even if I would be supportive of the study, I would not be supportive of it here in this bill. Yeah. So I, I don't uh, support either one it may come as no surprise, but um, if I were inclined to support either one it certainly wouldn't be i agree with george in this bill um given the the time constraints and you know we're going to be on the floor tomorrow with it I, I think the timing's off but um 
So that's where I am. I, I'm a no on both of those. Mark. Um, I, I just wanted to point out as you're thinking about this classification issue that um, if you were trying to set up a system that, that would tax second homeowners in Vermont in a different way, you'd also be taxing Vermonters who have second homes as well. You can't make a distinction between out of state people and in state people in order to raise money. So people who have camps, second homes anywhere would have to be subject to the same additional tax, which has been a problem in the past. Yeah. That's why this kind of thing takes a lot more discussion. It really does. Um, thank you, uh, Joey, and then Jim, and then Emily. And we do need to move on. I've got a, a chip is here on that education thing. So, Joey, uh, I just think I, I just wanted to say um, that this has been a conversation that has been ongoing so ever since I've been on Ways and Means, and um, I certainly think it needs a more in-depth study. I too, I would have always been supportive of um, having the whole system being based on income. And I hope at some point that we um, actually um, have the um, audacity to do that. So um, I'm gonna leave that as my last request to the committee as I move on. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Jim. I agree that it's better not to clutter up the bill. Um, and I agree that we don't want to change tax structure on the fly here. Um, I would just iterate that that I'll support the study because sure. it's a study, but I understand it's going to fail and that's fine with, with me. You know, we'll go forward and figure it out going you know, from here. Uh, Mark, did you want to jump back in or did you just forget to put your hand down? I think he forgot to put his hand down. Um, Good, okay, thank you, everybody. Um, and um, I don't know whether we'll t have time to vote today, we may, um, but um, I certainly have a sense of the committee. And um, what I wanna do now is um, uh, Chip is with us, I think he's still with us, are you still with us? Yes, hi, um, to talk about the, um, what I call the phase one budget. I don't know what people are calling it anymore. Uh, it's gone through a lot of names um, and uh, the uh, parts of the budget that deal uh, specifically with the education fund. So, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, so um, that's what I thought I was here for. It's good to know that <laughs> we're on the same page. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, as you probably know, we, we are calling it the phase one budget and I agree it keeps changing its name, but um, so far, I think we're we're on a, a phase one budget. Um, I'm sure your committee knows that um, right now we have um, the ed fund in there at 40% of of what the, we expect the total of the ed fund to be. Um, and I just I think I'm here to give you a little bit of a rationale for why we why we've done that. Um, you probably all know that um, we have decided um, in our phase one budget. Um, to do something a little different than what the governor was proposing, we're going to um, sort of, as a default, say that um, the funding in for the first quarter will be at 25% of uh, the adjusted FY20 levels. The governor had reduced um, that by 2%, meaning that the, the default was 23%. Um, there are some... Uh, some but or some funds that that are a little different, including the Ed Fund, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we have tried to be as consistent um, as possible um, with that 25%. And what and part of the reason for that is um, a couple of things. One, um, we don't want um, lots of people coming forward and saying why their budget really needs to have. Um, more than than the 25 percent if if there's not a particularly good reason for it uh, and we feel like the more we make exceptions the more people will be coming and, and asking for uh, a waiver from that basic um, de default um, the other thing is that you know and, and this i may be speaking maybe not for the committee so much but for myself is that there's a little bit of a danger um, when you say um, essentially the full 25% of, of last year's budget in a year where we know there are gonna be um, significant 
reductions that are going to have to happen. We just don't um, want uh, we and I say it, and I'm speaking a little bit personally here, but want to be careful that um, people are not looking to spend more in that first quarter than um, is uh, probably appropriate, um, given what they're going to have to do in the rest in the, their budgets in the rest of the year. Um, you know, I, so I've spoke to consistency. My favorite example so far is that we have a, a an engineer in the Department of Public Safety who designs um, uh, dry hydrants. His salary is fifty-five thousand dollars. For some reason, it's come up as an issue, and we're saying, nope, we're just going to give you a quarter of that salary uh, in the first uh, first quarter, and we'll take care of the rest of it when we do the rest of the budget. So, like I say, we're trying to be as consistent as we can. Um, there are some exceptions, you know, the probably I, I know that the chair wrote to um, Chair of Ways and Means that one of the things we're doing is in the uh, retirement and pension systems, we are funding those at 100%. Um, there's a reason for that, and um, that is that we expect that the rating agencies will um, look at that and see that even in a difficult year like this, we've um, right up front committed ourselves to fully funding those and that, that there will be benefits to that. Um, and so, um, like I say, there are some rare exceptions, but we're trying to trying to stick as closely to possible to this. And lastly, um, you know, we in our consultations with JFO, and I'd be happy to hear if you all feel differently, but um, uh, we have put in a number that we, we believe is um, more, a little bit more than sufficient to cover what is expected to have to go out of the um, Ed Fund in the first quarter. There's no, I mean, there's no uh, belief that we won't be funding the Ed Fund or as fully as it needs to be funded, um, but it's just a, a matter of trying to be consistent about how we address uh, all of state government at this point. So. Uh, questions, anyone on the committee has? So um, is there any anticipation that the amount that needs to be appropriated is going to be changed different when you come back and do the full budget? No, no, I mean, I, no. The, I mean, I think we'll, we are relying on you all and JFO and you know, Mark and all to tell us what is, what's the, what the numbers are but our understanding, my understanding from the testimony is that um, the number that, that I think Mark came up with it, um, I could be wrong about that, but uh, that, that would have to go out in the first quarter because of the way the Ed Fund gets rolled out was somewhere in the order of 34, 36% or something. Um, we've, had, we've put it in at 40 just to be 100% sure that, that we're safe, but um, but there's no intention to fund the Ed Fund any differently uh, or, or less fully than we would in any normal year. Um, we're just trying to, again, like I say, be consistent about what we put out in the first quarter relative to what we put out when we come back and do the budget, which it will actually be for the full year. Sam. Um, is that, <laughs> just in terms of the funding or the budget needs of schools, is the first quarter actually require a full quarter of the amount of the budget or is it flat the year or is it, I mean, really evenly divided by quarters? I mean, the first quarter is what? Well, August, August, September, October. Well, I'll give you my very July. understanding, uh, which is that because of the way the funding goes out to schools, it's not even over the year. It's, it's not easily dividable into quarters. Um, I, I believe that the, well, the administration had recognized that when they put out their proposal, I think they had it at 34, 36% instead of 25 um, with that recognition. We've talked to JFO and, and just, you know, I think cushioned it a little bit just to be absolutely sure. Um, but you'd have to ask Mark or perhaps your chair or somebody else okay. a lot more about how those roll out than I do. 
Okay. And uh, Chip, just so you know, uh, the Brookies are biting. I caught five of them the other day. <laughs> I'll be up. I have to get out of my committee. I mean, I think, I think the thing I'm struggling with is, you know, the, when we do the Ed Fund, we do a full year. We do the tax rates for a full year. We do the budgets for a full year. And I'm just trying to understand how this affects the Ed Fund balance sheet, um, which is, you know, to do a partial year appropriation when we have a, a it's structured as a full year um, operation. Um, maybe I'll ask Mark, who's here. Uh, so I, I'll just say, if, I don't know if you're asking Mark right now, but yeah, he, he's back on, but you go ahead. I, I'll just say that our committee, it, it's, we, we want, we want it to be clear that our communication team wants to be clear that we don't have any, we won't do anything that we think endangers um, the way funding rolls out or, um, you know, has any detrimental effects. Our, this is our proposal for, you know, this is the way we'd like to do it now um, with our, and our understanding from talking to various people is that, that this is, this works. Um, if, if we find out that there's some problem, we certainly want to know about it and, and we'll adjust. Well, I think, I think it, it leaves the, it leaves open our, the decision whether we're going to fully fund the entire um, education payment. That's how, that's how I would see it. Uh, Mark. Yeah, um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how the 40% came up. Uh, they came up with that. It was an appropriations issue, but I can, I can find out for you. I do know that the reason that they're having to wrestle with this differently is the education fund money goes out in a very different fashion than no, normal money goes out from the state budget because some of it comes into the education fund. Some of it goes directly to school districts. So, um, I will, um, I can check with Steve Klein and um, Stephanie Barrett to see what the rationale for the 40% was, but I, I don't really understand it. Uh, anyone on the committee? So have you already voted this? No. Uh, when do you no, vote? But we, it may, depending on how things go the rest of the day, it may, we may vote it out this afternoon. Um, if, if, I mean, I can't speak for the committee. My own reaction would be if, if we discover that there's any kind of a serious problem, there's always the option for, you know, amending it on the floor, you know, after hearing from you all. Um, and can I just get an understanding, or is your concern that we, um, if we only fund a portion of it now, that there, that there may be a a move from somewhere to um, reduce the amount of funding that we put into uh, schools to, into the ed fund overall and that by the end of the year we'll, we will have sort of indirectly reduced spending um i guess it's the uncertainty that concerns me um given the fact that we're setting tax rates for a year and budgets are all voted for a year but don't we don't we sort of have to send schools the amounts that they've voted on and, and budgeted? No, we're going to come back and pass another bill. George. Um, I just had a question for Mark, really. Um, and that is, I'm curious, what, what will the Ed Fund Outlook sheet look like yeah. with, with this? I'm I, I just trying to picture, and I can't, I'm having trouble. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand it either. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to have to do some more work on it because it's categorical aid. It's the education payment. They go out on all kinds of different schedules. Um, some of the money goes directly from the municipalities to the districts. Some of the money goes from the districts into the education fund. So I, I need to do more work before I can answer your question on this. I'm sorry. I just, I just found out about this this morning. So. Peter. Peter Conlon. Uh, yeah, I find myself joining the chorus of um, if it doesn't really matter, why are we doing this? Uh, it seems to me the Ed Fund works separately than the general fund. Ways and Means has made a commitment to fully fund it. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm, I'm among those who sort of under, not understanding what the purpose of the 40% is. If it really, in the end, doesn't make a difference. 
Other um, other questions, uh, comments anyone has? Um, George? Not really a question, but a comment. I just want to go on record opposing this concept. I, I, I don't think there's reason to do it, and I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's just going to make an already complicated system more difficult to deal with as time goes on, plus raise some uncertainty for the schools. And I, I just don't think it's a good idea. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Jim. Yeah, um, yeah, George, well stated. And I think um, that's where I come down at this point in time. If it doesn't make sense over 12 months, um, it's just going to make things too complicated for us. We'll have to do some sorting out that we'll, we'll regret later. So that's my 10 cents. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Um, Chip, I don't know if you're looking for the committee to weigh in. Um, or um, what you look, what you might be looking I mean, for. I'm, I and you've got three committees, obviously, with interest in it. Peter's here from education. Peter Conlon. Conlon is here from education committee. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I, I probably defer to the chair about how you would like to do this. Um, I, you know, I will certainly take the, your concerns back to our committee and I don't know if there's a conversation that happens um, between chairs um, or if, if you all, I mean, I'll leave it to the chair to let me know how you want to proceed, whether you want okay. to have a, a vote in your committee right now or Right. I have a note that Steve Klein wants to get in. Actually, it's a note from Mark. Um, is he trying to get in the meeting? I mean, he's welcome always. <laughs> so, um, I will send him the update. I mean, the link for the I meeting. The link. Okay. Um, oh, Mark just sent something. Anyway, yeah, thank, um, thank you. sorry, I was, Steve was asking to get in and I didn't know how to let him in. So if Sorsha can do it, that would be great. Okay. Good. Um, just want to know if um, I've heard from a few people on the committee. Anybody else want to chime in or people? Not sure where they where people are on it. Emily. I'll agree that the last thing that I think the districts need right now is even the slightest bit more uncertainty um, or confusion in how they're doing their work. Yeah. Um, so Steve, we're talking about the 40% um, yeah. education payment. And um, Okay, so uh, George, what is uh, um, it or? Well, we, you asked to join the meeting, and I'm not yeah. sure what whether you wanted to explain why it was happening, or whether you wanted to hear what we thought, or what was the purpose. So, um, oh, I just joined because Mark sent me an email saying I needed to be here, and so I didn't know what I, I was going to Yeah, Steve, I couldn't answer the question as to why the um, allocation in this uh, initial budget going out was going to be 40 percent, and how that would affect the education fund. Um, so, oh, you mean the, the balance sheet? education by not with the balance sheet yes so I, I and I, I this is what I'm thinking about since basically the 40 percent should cover any money flowing out of the ed fund between now and uh, the end of September the first three months of the year uh, it should not um, affect the operations of the of the ed fund or the balance sheet what it does actually do since we're not appropriating the full dollars in FY21, is just is, is the same as is the case in the general fund, you will not have spent all the money in FY21. It means it leaves until the August, September period to figure out the whole complexity of, of closing the year in some ways. That would be my first salvo. A salvo? Uh -huh. The first presentation <laughs> or whatever the, I don't know, what, I'm not sure what I, where you're going in which direction, so I didn't want to. Um, I, so I, I, George probably expressed it best and he's got his hand up, so I'm gonna let him express it again. Actually, I wasn't gonna express it again, but, oh, but, do I, but I can, but let me ask a question first. Yeah. Okay. So Steve, that, that sounds like for the education fund, you're leaving open the possibility that we won't send all the money to the schools that we have promised them. 
And I just don't understand the why. Why are we right. doing this with the education fund? What is the benefit if, if we're going to actually send them all the money eventually? What is the benefit of, of doing it this way um, and making them all uncertain, nervous? Um, I, I just I will just say that I, I am opposed to this. I think it's a bad right. idea. I think it's going to, to um, make the schools very edgy to do this and yeah. just don't see why. Okay, and so, th and I can't tell you that there's a, uh, there's a right answer to this question. Um, there, I think that the, uh, they're fully funding everything you need to spend by um, between now and um, September 30th. I, I can tell you there's many, many programs in state government that we're only funding through for three months that are equally need, in need, demanding, focused, that are, um, that have nine more months to go. So it's more just the nature of this bill that you're funding a quarter. So perceptions about why and perceptions about, I mean, I think the, the message is that we're, they're funding one quarter because there's a lot of stuff going on. And there's there are some limited cases where they are going to fully fund. And I think the one that is the most, uh, that I'm most aware of is the teacher's retirement funding and the state employee retirement funding because for the Wall Street, just to let them know that that commitment is 100%. They're the ones that are you're, you're, you are uh, raising this concern. It's not, I can't tell you it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really a policy choice. And I don't think anybody has been talking about and uh, not funding it in the long term. It's more just that the practice in this bill is to fund most of the cases 25%. Um, the other one where we have funded more like in the V and to give you some examples in VSAC, they have to get the money out, so that's being funded at 50% uh, because they need to know it's there for the first semester. Um, it's been trying to, it's been designed to, to uh, make sure we can cover all needs for that first quarter and then go from there. It's not a, uh, I don't think it was done to sort of indicate that there are going to be reductions, but it's, uh, done because that's the nature of the bill. But I, I, would, I would turn it over to Representative Conquist who can sort of be more, uh, I don't focus on the committee. I don't have anything to add. I mean, I, I think we said essentially the same thing, um, you and I, to this committee, so. Uh, other committee members have questions? Um, I'm not sure exactly where to proceed from here. Um, I guess I'd, I'd be curious whether there was any, whether there was any discussion about this in the Appropriations Committee and any argument being made along the lines of the argument that George has made um, in the committee. Or was it just, this is what we're doing for everybody, this is what we're doing here? I'm sorry, are you asking, did we make a, did anyone? Did anybody make the argument that George has made? Um, in your committee. Which is that this causes concern among the, the schools and... Um, and it leaves op open the question about whether we're going to um, fulfill the commitment to um, provide full funding for the schools. Um, no. Uh, the chair has gone out of her way to um, say in every situation of you know, Ed Fund um, uh, any other fund that we were talking about or any other budget that that this is not we're not um saying that what what you're getting here is a, an indication of what you will get for the full year this is just addressing first quarter issues to make sure everybody has what they need to get through the first quarter um and that uh, the decisions you know in other budgets anyway the decisions about what the full year funding will look like will be made in August and September. But, uh, can I, I, I don't mean to cause havoc, but there was some discussion that somebody in the committee did bring up the idea of fully funded and then other people talked about a concern about why uh, there was a discussion of this at one point in the committee. Okay. And I think yeah, so just good. to echo what, um, yeah. what uh, Representative Conquest pointed out, the, the chair did say that they were going to make very clear in their presentation that this is in no way implying that they're not going to fund it. It's just that it was the um, being in that quarter for 
and you would have to talk to her. There was a reason why they felt that that was more appropriate to do, but they um, they were not doing it with the goal of reducing the funding. They just doing it for the appropriateness goal. Anyone else have any questions of Steve or of Chip? Chip, thank you for joining us. Are you headed back in your committee room? I, I believe Steve might know better than I, but I don't think we're meeting anymore, but I will um, oh. convey all of the concerns that I've jotted down here to the to our committee. Um, I would assume that there'll be some further conversation before we um, have a, a vote on this particular part of the okay. bill. Um, right, you know, um, if there's room for somebody from our committee to join you, um, I think George articulates the concerns as well as anybody. I might ask if you could do that, but I'll, I'll I can talk with Kitty about that. Uh, Jim. Um, yeah, Steve Klein's last comments about um, being clear what the money's for, and then it's not an intention to cut funding later in the the uh, fiscal year, I think were very, very helpful. I'm not sure how that might be articulated to all the parties, but th his comments were very helpful. You mean, so it would be including some language in the bill that says it's our intention to fully well, fund this? As, as I guess Chip said earlier, you know, we leave it to the chairs to figure out just how to word things, but but I, I take, um, people at their word that this is not a backhanded attempt to cut education to education funding. So um, it would be nice if there's a clean way to articulate it just so everybody is, um, doesn't get uh, wigged out about it. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Chip, for joining us. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> Thanks, um, might leave anyway, but I appreciate the offer. Uh, and I will just say that we've been, um, the chair has been welcoming people from other committees, so I'm certain that she would welcome somebody from Ways and Means, uh, George, if he's if he's your uh, designee, um, to come talk to us. So I'll pass that on to her. Oh, thanks. Um, Peter Conlon, um, is the Ed Committee meeting today? We are, we, we meet at noon. Um, okay. Yeah, and I'll certainly provide an, an update. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually that would be helpful because- I, mean, I think that we yeah. would probably get stuck on, in the, on this issue anyway, on the, on the why question. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody.